Good evening. Welcome to tonight's service. Glad everybody had a chance to come out tonight. I hope everybody had a good Christmas or New Year's and ready to get back into the Word. The title of tonight's message is called What God Calls Us to Be. What God Calls Us to Be. Our scripture we're going to be looking at is Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. If you will please stand for the reading of God's Word, I'll give you a second to turn to it. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the call of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So what God calls us to be, a lot of times you think once somebody gives their life to Christ, as a new Christian, a lot of people wonder, what's next? What's next? Where do I go from here? This, when you look at this passage and break it down word for word, this is a very powerful passage. And just think about this. This passage was written about 53 AD after the death of Christ by Paul. But this word endureth forever. It is still used today. Folks, it's good then and it's good now. You know, 1 Peter 1 25 says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. We're going to talk about three things that God calls us to be as Christians as we serve Him. Number one, the first thing we see in this scripture is that He calls us to be servants. We see this in uh, verse one. Every letter that Apostle Paul wrote and, and throughout the books of the Bible, if you look and you read the introduction, he opens it with uh, Apostle Paul, a bond servant for Christ, or for Jesus Christ. Now, you ever think about that, why he does that? The word servant, translated as a doulos in the old uh, Greek term, which means slave. He calls himself a bond servant of Christ. In biblical times, there were different classes among the people as today. Today, you know, we've got the, the lower class or the poor, the middle class, the upper class, and the super rich. Well, back then, there were even classes among the slaves. And being a bond servant was the lowest class that you could be. If you were a bond servant, you were the bottom of the barrel. And when you think about that, all your strength, all your time, your efforts, everything that you did belonged to somebody else. That was not yours to do. You were at their whim, whatever they wanted, if you were a bond servant. Think of it that way. At your every will. Jesus calls us to be servants. We are for what he has for us to do. He's a plan for us to do. Whatever it is, we need to do it. In the same way, we are bond servants to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 
John 8, 32 reminds us where Jesus says, And ye shall know the th truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, how is that relevant? Well, if you're a bond servant, we think of that being bondage you can't get out. But, if you know the truth, and what is the truth? The Word of God. This is the truth that stands forever. If we know the Scriptures, we know the Word. We study the Word. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Christ frees you from the bondage. Believe it or not, everyone is a slave. I'm a slave. You're a slave. Everybody is a slave. Right now, we're a slave to Christ. We're a bond servant to Christ. If you've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, you are His. If that is not you, or you have never accepted Christ, unfortunately, you're a slave to sin. And from what we know about sin, sin equals death. And death is the absence of God. That's whatever keeps you from the truth of living a life for God. Or living the life that God called you to live. And that keeps you in bondage. That keeps you in sin. If we look at Ephesians 2.10, the word says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Walk in them. Good works. Does that mean you're saved by works? No, not hardly. You are saved to serve Christ. And Christ forgives you of our sins. But to serve is active when we serve our Lord and Savior. The works that we do in the church, in the community, those works are what we're talking about. That is how we serve the Lord. So we are a servant to Christ. The great thing about it, when you think about it, God has already laid out a plan for you to serve him. How many of you like to have an agenda? Have everything planned out ahead of time? You know, on this date at this time, we're going to do this. This doctor's going on this time. This one's here. You like that? Not that perfect. It's hard to do with God. He has his agenda that we must answer to. And the great thing about it, he knows the time and the place that we need to be in serving him. And he will make it known to us when he is ready. And miraculously, we wind up right where he wants us to be, doing exactly what he wanted us to do. If it's to talk to this person about Christ, if it's to do this, uh, serve this meal for somebody that's maybe their, their home's been burnt, and they have no place to stay, help that way with serving, providing clothes for them, whatever it may be, he puts us in that place at that right time. As his servants, Paul writes, we are separated to the gospel of God. We are marked off with a boundary separating us from the sin in the world. I like to think of that as a big hedge put around us. In the Old Testament, we see it talking about the sheep and the sheep herds. Well, the shepherds put set up as pens and we're in the flock of the Lord. He's got his pens around us, protecting us. After all, we are his. And he won't let anything happen to us. When you think of the word gospel, what do you think the word gospel means? Have you ever thought about that? When I looked it up, my version, gospel means good news. Forgiveness, His grace, and our purpose. 
That's the good news that we need to share. Amen. So he calls us to be a servant. The second thing we see that he calls us to be is a solicitor. Now, I know a lot of times you think solicitors get a bad rap, but hear me out, please. Number one, as Christians, we are the salt and light of the earth, being a light for others to show them the way to Christ. We are the solicitors who lead people to the faith in Jesus Christ. We show them the way, and Jesus saves them. Amen? That is our job. We have been given a great opportunity to do that, Amen. which is very important. It's a wonderful experience when you get to do that. Amen. To be a solicitor, or a servant or a solicitor, to be a solicitor, we have a new heart. Have you ever heard about a new heart? We talk about when you get saved and the change happens. Okay. Look back in Ezekiel, the prophet, in 36, 26. It says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. The Lord gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us a new heart. This is Ezekiel talking about what happened way before Christ came. That's pretty awesome that that change takes place. When I think of solicitors, many times I think of door to door salesmen. Uh, I always try to sell you something. Most folks don't like them when they come knocking on your door, do you? Let's just do that. Solicitors for Christ, we're not selling anything. We are showing the way. Faith and salvation are free. There is no cost. There is no fee. That pirate price was paid over 2,000 years ago in blood by Jesus Christ when he was crucified. He fulfilled the prophecy of the Old Testament. I believe that's so hard for people to accept because it's free. Even today, we put stuff out and say, free, come take it. I just want to get rid of it. People won't take it. You put $5 on it, everybody in the brother shows up to get it. I don't know why, but praise God, salvation is free. It doesn't cost anybody anything. It cost God everything that He was willing to pay for each and every one of us. He paid it in blood. He washed our sins white as snow. The next thing God causes us to be, He calls us to be saints for Him. We look at verse 7 in our passage. All who are loved by God are called saints. A lot of times the terminology is mistaken because of Catholicism and Catholics. They have St. Mary, St. Joseph, whoever did this, are saint, saint, saint. But when you look at the world during the time when this letter was written, it was to be delivered to Rome which at that time was the largest city in the world, the largest in the Roman Empire. That city had a population of over one million. Today we see a lot of similarities between Rome and America. Their symbol for their empire was an eagle. Our symbol for America is the eagle. When we look at what's going on in America with the immorality running rampant, seeing everywhere uh, delusions, 
anything you can think of, homosexuality, whatever it is. You look at Rome, uh, Rome at that time, it was identical, the same thing. Folks, if you look at America, we're heading down that same road for destruction. When I say we're called to be saints, we're called to be separated from sin. That's what being a saint means. We're sanctified. We're separated. God has taken us out of the world, put us in His fold. We're no longer part of the world. We're part of the family of God. He has separated us. He sanctified us. Amen? Amen. That is so awesome to believe. Amen. To understand what it is in here. Amen. Roman believers were called to be saints. The translated word for saints is hagos, which means this Greek word meaning sanctified or set apart for God's purpose. Remember, Jesus came to the earth he was divine. He left heaven and became man. He had a purpose. His purpose was to die on the cross and be resurrected. Not only that we might be saved by grace, but that might, we might also have his peace. And when you think about today, when we go to the Lord in prayer, when we have troubles, when we have trials, tribulations. Jesus was divine, but Jesus was man as well. He walked the earth. He knows what it's like to be tempted by Satan. He has been there, folks. And he's already conquered it. And He is there for us. He shows us the way. He's the one that guides us through. Have that faith of that mustard seed. Jesus will conquer everything. Put your faith in Him. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, but I give unto you from Christ. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know, so when you think about that peace that he's given, you know, we talked about sainthood. Peace is important. That's a gift from, from the Lord Jesus. If you know your history in your Bible, when you turn to the last encounter, or excuse me, the first encounter when Jesus came back from the resurrection and he saw the disciples in the upper room, what did he tell them? First thing he said was, peace be with you, be not afraid. That peace carries on today with each and every one of us. Every one of us should have that peace inside knowing that He's our Savior. Amen. All of us are going to have trials and tribulations. He's not going to take them away, but He will show us how to get through it. He may not lift the pain, but He'll make it bearable. Amen. God calls us to be three things. Servants, solicitors, and saints. And I want to ask you, in closing, each one of these areas, if you look at your life, where do you need improvement with your relationship with the Lord and Savior? You know, is it the sainthood? Is it the solicitation of others? Is it serving Him? Don't say it out loud and don't raise your hand. But I tell you, I know I need improvement. There's always room for us to improve. Just think about how you can improve and what you can do better to serve Christ.
to really serve somebody in the end is really just to be blessed by Christ when you look at it. Because it's not what you do here. That rewards it there in heaven and it can't be taken away from you. I want you to commit to making things right with God. If there's something that needs improvement, please commit to do it. The altar is open. If you want to come and pray, I'll pray with you. I'll get someone to pray with you if you need it. But just think about it in your life. What can we do? What can you do to improve? We all have things in our life that we fall short on. I do. Eddie does. Kim does. We all do. There's certain things. Amen. What do you think about? Where can I improve? Amen. The more you commit and turn it over to Him, the more blessings you'll receive later. He'll take that burden off of you if there's something. If there's something that's prohibiting you from accepting that part to being that servant, that's in your way of sin. You know, it's, any little sin can keep you out of heaven. Just remember, if there's something you need to talk to the Lord about, come talk to him. All right.